deep inside our planet, there are two massive blobs of rock that have puzzled scientists for years. They sit deep inside, opposite each other. One lurks under the Pacific Ocean, the other under Africa. And they're so weird, they even make seismic waves slow down. Their actual name is Large Low Velocity Provinces, but they're just two enormous, mysterious blobs of rock, bigger than continents, stranger than anything else inside the Earth, and so dense they might be leftovers from another planet. Until recently, no one knew what they were, where they came from, or why they even exist. These mysterious blobs could hold the secret to Earth's deepest forces powerful enough to shape earthquakes, drive volcanic eruptions, and even influence the evolution of life itself. And now, we might finally learn the truth about them. These geological monsters are hidden about 1,800 miles beneath the surface. Each one is a hundred times taller than Mount Everest, so vast they defy explanation. Now, at first, scientists thought these were primordial remnants from Earth's early days. Maybe something giant smashed into Earth about 4.5 billion years ago, and this impact formed both the Moon and these blobs. Scientists believe it could have been a planet named Thea, a Mars-sized planet that existed somewhere around the asteroid belt and slammed into Earth back in the day. Others believe it could be something much more familiar, old chunks of Earth's crust. Perhaps they got pushed deep into the mantle by the movement of tectonic plates. And now, a new study shows that these blobs are massive piles of oceanic crust that have been sinking into the Earth for billions of years. They could have formed from the stuff that sinks into Earth when tectonic plates collide. Over a billion years, pieces of ocean crust could have been swallowed by the mantle. Eventually, they collected into two massive regions deep inside the planet. But even though both blobs form the same way, they aren't identical. There's this place called the Pacific Ring of Fire, a giant loop of volcanoes and earthquake zones around the Pacific Ocean. Well, the Pacific Blob doesn't just stop growing and changing because it's constantly being fed fresh rock from that place. Tectonic plates crash into each other, and one plate sinks beneath another, pushing old ocean crust deep into the Earth. Since this keeps happening, the Pacific Blob is heavier, denser, and more active than its twin under Africa. It's like a giant hot rock factory, constantly getting new material and reshaping itself over time. The African blob is much older and quieter than the one under the Pacific. It doesn't get fresh rock pushed into it as often. That's why, over time, it has blended more with the surrounding mantle. Since it's less dense, it behaves differently. It rises higher into the Earth's mantle, stretching 340 miles closer to the surface. And that might be why Africa has so many powerful volcanoes and rift valleys today. The biggest question is, how do they keep evolving? Scientists think that huge columns of hot rock, called mantle plumes, might be pushing up from deep inside the Earth, helping to drive the movement of tectonic plates in the Pacific. If they're right, then these giant underground blobs aren't just sitting there. They're almost alive in a way. They'd be constantly changing and shaping the surface of our planet. But why do they even matter? Because these weird underground structures may be shaping Earth's surface in ways we don't fully understand yet. You see, first, they might influence Earth's magnetic field. That's because they affect how heat moves through the mantle and core. They might also hold clues about the history of plate tectonics. Studying them could help us figure out when subduction began on Earth, whether it was over 4 billion years ago or much more recently. These guys might also be secret puppet masters behind volcanic activity. There's a theory that blazing hot rock from deep inside the Earth, the same kind that creates volcanic hotspots, might be rising straight from the giant blobs in the mantle. Some of the biggest volcanoes on Earth, including those in Hawaii, Iceland, and Yellowstone, sit directly above the suspected rising plumes from these blobs. If these blobs are fueling these volcanoes, then they could be responsible for shaping Earth's continents, climate, and even mass extinctions throughout history. And well, that's horrifying. That would mean that these giant structures might burst through Earth's crust one day, unleashing catastrophic supervolcanic eruptions, and these eruptions would last for millions of years. 
Beneath the Earth's surface also lies monsters, unlike anything else on this planet. Super volcanoes. They're so massive, so destructive, and so rare that no human has ever witnessed one erupt. A regular volcanic eruption can be terrifying. Lava spewing into the sky, ash choking the air, entire cities buried under fire and stone. But a supervolcano? Well, that's something else entirely. A supervolcano isn't just big, it's a category of its own. Their eruptions rip apart the Earth itself, creating massive craters called calderas. Some of them are over 30 miles wide. A regular volcanic eruption might spew out a few cubic miles of lava and ash. A supervolcano unleashes more than 240 cubic miles of material. That's enough to bury an entire continent in ash. An eruption like this would be newsworthy, to say the least. First, a wall of fire would blow up into the sky. Ash would block out the sun for years, dropping global temperatures. Entire countries could be buried under meters of ash, making farming impossible. Famine, extreme cold, and toxic air could wipe out entire civilizations. It wouldn't just be a local disaster, it would be global. In fact, two of the worst mass extinctions in Earth's history, where almost all life was wiped out, might have been caused by supervolcanoes, not asteroids. The biggest and most horrifying one was at the end of the Permian period. Literally, about 90% of all marine species and 70% of land species went poof. Scientists have counted about 20 supervolcanoes on Earth today. The most famous ones are Yellowstone in the US, Toba in Indonesia, and Topau in New Zealand. Now, the last time Yellowstone erupted was roughly 2 million years ago. It released almost 590 cubic miles of material, enough to bury a city like New York. That was just one of three Yellowstone super eruptions. The most recent supervolcano to erupt was Topau in New Zealand. This happened about 26,500 years ago. But supervolcanoes don't just destroy, they reshape the entire planet. About 74,000 years ago, the Toba supervolcano erupted in Indonesia. Some scientists believe it triggered a volcanic winter that lasted an entire decade. There are also theories that suggest that this eruption nearly wiped out early humans. It reduced their numbers to just a few thousand survivors, although that's just speculation. Either way, we know for sure that supervolcano eruptions have changed the course of history. So, how do we prepare for them if this could happen at any moment? Well, scientists monitor volcanoes constantly, looking for warning signs. It could be stuff like rising magma, ground swelling, earthquakes beneath a volcano, changes in gas emissions, and so on. The problem is that while we can predict short-term eruptions, the long-term ones are still a mystery. Yellowstone last erupted 630,000 years ago. It's literally overdue for another eruption already. But volcanoes don't work like clocks. Just because one erupted in the past doesn't mean it will definitely go wild again, and the time between eruptions could be random. Scientists think Yellowstone could erupt again, but it might be just a small lava flow instead of a super eruption. Are we ready for a super eruption if it happens? Eh, probably not. Scientists say we're more prepared for an asteroid strike than a supervolcano eruption. When Hunga Tonga Hunga Ha'abai erupted in 2022, it cut off communications, caused tsunamis, and filled the sky with ash. And that was only a magnitude 5 eruption. A supervolcano would be orders of magnitude worse. So, <laughs> good luck sleeping at night knowing these guys will erupt again. Maybe tomorrow, maybe in a hundred thousand years. Nah, don't lose sleep over it. Our planet has five oceans. The Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, Southern, and Arctic. <laughs> Not counting Billy Ocean. But it seems there's a sixth one out there too. It's just that you can't see it. Scientists have found evidence of large amounts of water hidden in the transition zone. That's the boundary layer that separates the upper and lower mantle of our planet. That boundary goes hundreds of miles deep down below the surface. Natural diamonds usually form in the mantle, but at depths of up to 155 miles. Some of them are very rare. They may come from deeper depths. 
That was the case with this fascinating diamond that formed 410 miles below the surface. The gem was big enough for scientists to study it and determine what it was made of. They were surprised when the composition of this very rare diamond showed that it was formed in pretty watery conditions. Because of that, such a diamond wouldn't be worth much in jewelry stores, but it was priceless in the lab. So, could this mean there's an ocean under the surface of our planet? It would definitely get us closer to the idea Jules Verne had about this whole magical secret world inside Earth, including the ocean. But that's not exactly the case. The water is there, true, but it's not like you can enjoy the view watching waves splashing around like on the surface of our planet. The water is actually stored within the minerals. That's why this area is so wet. Let's now move to Africa to keep up with the story, or to be more specific, to a spot called the Afar region. It's part of Ethiopia and a place where three tectonic plates meet. Tectonic plates are large pieces of our planet's crust that slowly move. These movements cause earthquakes and produce volcanoes, mountains, deep underwater valleys we call trenches, and so on. And the Afar Valley is where the Arabian, Somali, and Nubian plates meet. Together, they form an intersection in the shape of a Y. Why? Let me tell you! <laughs> These plates are moving all the time. The Somali plate is moving southeast toward the Australian and Indian plates. The Arabian plate is moving north, getting closer to the Eurasian plate. At some point, it will close the Persian Gulf. This movement of plates has created something we call the Great Rift Valley, considering there are, you know, all these cool rifts. The Aden Ridge to the east, the Red Sea Rift to the west, the Oculus Rift and the East African Rift to the south. But the East African Rift is something we want to focus on, because this one could be the key to this potential sixth ocean, but this time on the surface. A continental rift is a spot where two tectonic plates that form a single continent start to separate. Here it's the Somali and Nubian plates. Together, they're parts that make up Africa. If they keep moving in separate directions, this currently continental rift may become what we call an oceanic spreading ridge. In other words, when the plates are far enough apart from each other, there will be an enormous crack between them. This way, magma will freely flow up from beneath them. It'll be cool and eventually start creating a new ocean floor. Africa will be split into two parts, and there will be a new ocean flowing between what will turn into two mini-continents. Nope, it's not time to get your swim trunks and sunscreen yet. Even if the Somali and Arabian plates do move far enough to form an oceanic spreading ridge, it'll take eh, millions of years before this happens. So I guess it's more interesting to stick to exploring the sixth ocean below the Earth's surface for now. The idea of subsurface oceans goes beyond the borders of our planet. It's possible many moons and planets out there have them too. Our home planet is the only one we know about with consistent bodies of liquid water on the surface, true. In our solar system, we circle around the Sun in something called the habitable zone. The temperature and atmospheric pressure within this zone allow water to remain in liquid form all the time. But a couple of moons in our solar system could also contain significant amounts of water under their surface. Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons, is the first one. Enceladus is a small frozen ball, seven times smaller in diameter than our moon, but it's the sixth biggest moon of Saturn. Nearly a decade ago, a spacecraft found evidence that there was a large ocean under its surface. It found and sampled water from the eruptions that resembled geysers. A geyser is a rare type of hot spring that erupts and sends jets of steam and water into the air. You know, like Old Faithful in Yellowstone? Well, this water was erupting through fissures in the ice at the south pole of the moon. That means there might be a liquid ocean under the thick layers of ice. The ocean there is almost nothing like ours. The ocean on Earth is relatively shallow, on average 2.2 miles deep, and it covers three-quarters of our planet's surface. It gets colder the closer you come to the seafloor, and is warmer if you stay close to the surface because of the sun's rays. But the subsurface ocean on Enceladus is at least 18 miles deep. 
It's cooler at the top because that part is near the ice shell, and warmer at the bottom because of the heat coming from the moon's core. But both our ocean and the ocean on Enceladus are salty. Enceladus is one of the few places in our solar system that has liquid water, which makes it an interesting spot to search for signs of life. Another one is Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Scientists think similar eruptions of water could be happening there. Knowing there are such geysers there tells us these moons have their own source of energy. Maybe the energy that makes the water erupt comes from gravity or radiation. The same energy could keep a large body of liquid water under the ice. It could even support some forms of life. There are thousands of planets beyond our solar system that orbit other stars. Some are even in the habitable zone. Over a quarter of the ones that we know about could have liquid water. But the majority of them probably have oceans under their surface, like Enceladus and Europa. Pluto might be on this list too, since it's possible it hides a liquid ocean under its thick frozen shell. This subsurface ocean likely formed long after the dwarf planet did, after the heat coming from radioactive elements in Pluto's core melted some of its ice. There's also something called water worlds. Those are moons or planets with global oceans that are more common than we thought. I mean, some call Earth a water world too. 71% of its surface is water, after all. And when you look at our home planet from space, you mostly get those blue marble pictures. When exploring other planets, especially those outside of our solar system, researchers often go with a policy of follow the water. After all, water is the main element we know that's necessary for supporting life. And when there's a water world that's close to its parent star, Scientists assume it must have formed way farther and then moved closer once its orbit shrank. The composition of the planet was set when it was in a colder orbit, or, in other words, when it made a wider circle around its star. We call the process of orbital shrinking a migration. And if water worlds are really that common, it can be proof that migration really happens. Exoplanets are all those planets that orbit around other stars, not our Sun. Some exoplanets may have oceans that are way deeper than any of those in our solar system, hundreds or even thousands of miles deep. Our Mariana Trench is scary, and it's not even 7 miles deep. And those exoplanet oceans are, wow, almost bottomless. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.